And the students that have done really well with me are the ones that learn not to do those same mistakes. Are you willing to listen to me? Are you going to be the guy that feels like, or gal, it feels like it, you're the exception to the rule? You're not going to be the exception to the rule. So don't waste time doing that. Invest in learning. Invest in doing the right things and allow yourself the comfort and the enjoyment of discovering who you are as a trader. You may not be a day trader, but you can use my day trading entry models inside of short-term trading or swing trading. I take you into the lower time frames to prove, number one, that it's not noise. Two, authorship. Three, that you can keep risk managed. You're going to lose. I lose. But you're not going to find who you are as a trader that you finally settle in. Okay, I promise you, anybody out there that would be either a supporter of me or talk to smack about me, they did not learn how to do this in a year. They didn't do it in less than a year. I promise you, I don't care who's telling you what storyline. I don't care. I don't care. Okay, they did not discover who they are and settle in on that. Because if they did, they wouldn't be looking at my stuff. They wouldn't even care about anybody else. They would be just doing their own thing, and they would have receipts proving all that stuff. And they don't have none of that stuff because everybody wants to be the next thing. When ICT goes away in November, I'm no longer on social media. I'm flying back to my personal life. Everybody's going to be in a hurry to get up here and try to be the next thing. That's normal. My hope is that the, the people that are trying to do that or aspiring to do that don't waste too much time with them. Don't waste so much time trying to have the payout of social media clout. Because if you're not satisfied with being profitable and, and comfortable in your own skin, that's a problem. And that's how it was for me. I had to live online on America Online to feel comfortable. The wind's picking up here to breathe. It probably just muffled up on the, the phone. I apologize if that happened. You okay, girl? Daily, I think she just ate a bug. But the uh, I'm wrinkled up, man. I've been in this pool since I jumped in uh, on the first live uh, Twitter space. <laughs> I'm sitting here on the step enjoying it. It's 92 degrees in this pool. It feels like a bathtub. Oh, you're bragging ICT. No, no, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. But anyway, some of you wanted to know my testimony and how I am where I am and how I got here. So when I was a young man, I was like, I don't know, about somewhere between 14 and 16 years old. I don't know what date it was, but my, my best friend, who I've known since pre-K, uh, we were laying on his parents' picnic table in the backyard. We were looking up at the stars, and he was dating a girl who he's married to now, and he was part of her uncle's church and they were a Trinitarian church and he was wrestling with this idea of a Trinity. And I've never subscribed to a Trinity. I, there's only one God. And I believe Jesus Christ was the embodiment of that God. And just like I was mentioning earlier, um, I'm a father to my children. I'm a husband to my wife and I'm a son to my mother. It doesn't require three Michaels. It's one person, one entity that is me. And I have relationships or roles in the office that I fulfill. So if I was to write a check to you, I wouldn't sign an ICT. I wouldn't sign it the husband of my wife or the father of Caleb. Okay, it would be my name. The, the authority is in my name. And Christ came and revealed that authority. And, uh, Acts chapter 4, 12 says there's no name given among men whereby we must be saved. So I understand there's going to be people that are Muslim that are listening to this. I understand that there's going to be people that are Hindu. There's going to be people that are atheists. And you're going to hear me say this stuff. And it's kind of going to be very divisive for you. And you're going to want to hate me because I said these things. I'm answering the question that people have asked. Okay. I'm not trying to convert you because I can't. When I was younger, I tried. I tried really, really hard to do those types of things. And the only thing I'm doing now is doing what the word says. Always be ready to give a reason for your testimony and why you believe what you believe. So, 
I told my friend Sean, I said, listen, um, you know, we're like brothers. Uh, we, we've known each other since pre-K. Uh, I'm not saying don't have a relationship with God, but I don't believe what you are stating that God is, is biblical. And he wrestled with that. You know, he's no longer you know, Trinitarian, but he is still obviously a believer in Christ. And he believes that you know, God manifests himself in the flesh and that flesh was not fathered by any man and no egg from Mary created it either. So he created it. He prepared that body. And in that body was a Holy Spirit. It's the same one. And just like when the apostles asked Christ himself, they said, you keep talking about the father. Show us the father and it will satisfy us You because know, we don't know who that is. And Jesus immediately turned around to him and said, listen, have I been with you so long that you don't know who I am? If you see me, you see the Father. So how can you ask me, show us the Father, when it's the Father who is talking to you? See, you can't say that the flesh is the Father. That's not the Father. That's the part that we refer to as the Son. That's the Son of God. That flesh, that was the Sonship. That part of the Godhead. It's one God that manifests himself in flesh. There's one mediator between God and man. That's Christ only. There is no other God. That is it. So when you want to ask me, how is it that I learned all this? How is it that I knew these things? When I was a young man and I wanted to end myself and I didn't have the courage to do it, I came home from work one evening and uh, one of the routes that I did, I was going across the key bridge and Bill, Bill Burr, as a comedian, he, make, he makes us get about intrusive thoughts. And uh, while sometimes it is funny, admittedly, it's really not appropriate to laugh at stuff like that because I've had instances where I literally felt like I wanted to drive off that key bridge. And one day I made every in intention of doing it. I had lost money. I had lost my wife. I lost my grandfather. Uh, I felt lost. And I hated doing what I was doing. I was making less than $250 a week bring home. But I was spending six days a week doing it. Working on a Saturday, servicing one convalescent home down on Fayette Street in downtown Baltimore. But Monday through Friday, 13 and a half hours. Would you do that? No. Most, most people wouldn't. But... I was initially thinking, if I can learn everything about this business, make money, I'll buy my own machines, my own vending machines, and I'll know everything about this business that I, I'm looking at as I'm paying tuition. Just like, uh, I guess it would be considered like a uh, uh, intern, where you, you're not really getting paid, you're just there to get the experience. Which is very expensive, by the way. But I felt defeated. I felt like I was at my wit's end. And I, I just, I had lots of books. I had lots of things in my head, but I couldn't make that stuff and retail stuff work. It just, every time I got into a trade, either I would be scared because I lost money before I lost an account or I would be immediately stopped out. And it was very, very uh, discouraging. And while I didn't have a gun, I probably probably would have hurt myself if I had one then. I felt like I was being invited many times driving over that key bridge. Like I just want to whip the wheel over there and just go off the edge of it. Well, the day I was in the stop right before going across the key bridge, and I would go to Telco, which was a stop that... Uh, didn't make a whole lot of money, but I hated going to it. I figured, well, once I service that one, I'll be going over to Key Bridge, and then I'm going to do it today. I'll probably pass out on my way down. I probably won't feel anything, but nobody's going to miss me. And that's the depth of where I was. Nobody could have reached me. There was no cell phone, no text messages that encouraged me not to do it. And I didn't tell anybody I was going to do it. Because listen, folks, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. 
people that talk about doing it, they just want someone to say, I love you. Don't do that. They don't want to really hurt themselves. But that day I did. I felt empty, worthless. I looked at my history. My own parents didn't want anything to do with me. And the only person that looked at me like a son was my grandfather. He was gone. I had no, no direction in life. And yes, I believed in God, but that wasn't enough at the time. And I needed to feel some, some, kind, of, some kind of purpose, some, some reason to be here because there was no reason for me to want to be here. I got on the key bridge, got on the right lane, got to the top, stopped. Put my hazards on. I said, it would be terrible for me to take this truck and hurt this company. They'd have to pay for that damage. I'm just going to go off of it. It only takes me a second to get up there. I'm just going to step off and that's it. Once I'm over, it's over. I can't stop it. And again, I'll probably pass out before I hit. And I don't know. I don't know why that day. What was the like? I didn't wake up that morning and, and think it. It was while I was working. While I was working and thinking about what I was doing and how I felt trapped doing that. And I didn't I didn't see an out. I never drank alcohol. I never did drugs. But I was not in the right state of mind that day. Some said Go home and don't think about it. So I'm sitting there. People are beeping their horn at me. Give me the finger going by. You a-hole. What the... You know, whatever. Typical Baltimore. So I started the truck again. Went to the stops. Finished my route. Didn't hang out like I usually did with my employer. Drove home, numb, no radio. Didn't lift weights that day. Went in, got a shower, didn't eat. And I sat in there and I stared at my computer. And I'm, I'm going to toss this out there because when I did a Corbs interview, I facetiously said, yeah, my laptop died. That was a snub against the people that talk about how I have multiple laptops and I'm cherry picking. Uh, it was a desktop. That's what it was that was no longer working for me. It was a Hewlett Packard. And it was very slow. But I sat there, looked at all the books I had bought, and remembered all the hopes I had and waiting for them to arrive. And all the trips that I drove out to Columbia, Maryland, to the Trader's Library, which was a, I'm not even sure if it's even a place anymore. I'm not sure if it even exists. Now that I'm thinking about it, when I'm done here, I'm going to have to Google it and see if the Trader's Library still exists. But I used to go out there every week and I'd buy something. I paid $50 a week, room and board at my aunt and uncle's house. Same uncle that inspired me to get into trading when I was 14, 15 years old. but it wasn't interested because I was in the martial arts and that's all I cared about then. Just like anybody else, like, like kids, you know, they ain't going to listen to you. You know, you have the right instructions and guidance. You don't want to listen. And just like many of you, you're like my children. Some of you are probably older than me, but you still act like a child. You don't listen to good advice. And some of you act like that. I had no ad adversities. Like it was just too easy for me. It was unfair. Everything worked out for me. You have no idea the darkest corners of where I was and where I came from. I didn't have the courage to do what I said I was going to do when I got on that bridge. But something 
inspired me to go home and stop thinking about that. And when I got home that evening, I pulled out the price charts, which was a weekly service that was a, I got it for the financials and the agricultural markets. And it was ran by Nick Van Nice. He is the, uh, he's the guy that you know as a hidden divergence or trend following divergence in the stochastics. Uh, he's the guy that codified that. George Lane didn't do that and nobody else ever did either. And me and Larry Williams are the only ones that ever give that guy credit for that. But he has service that as a commodity trader, we updated our charts by hand. And I pulled out the charts. I was looking at them and it just looked like Greek to me. Like I was disconnecting. Like I wasn't I wasn't interested in it anymore. For the first time, I, I looked at these things and said, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I can't see what it is that I'm supposed to see. And I just basically at my wits end, I said, you know, God, I've never really invited you into this. But I feel broken. I feel like I have no worth. And I don't want to be here. I was never more interested in anything else in my life prior to that day than I was in the markets. And in that day, I was ready to disconnect entire everything. And I just laid it on the line. I said, I know you exist. I know you've been with me and I know I'm here because of you. But why? Like, what do I have to show for it? Like, I work so hard at this and I can't get it to work. I said, I'm going to ask you something. And you know my heart right now, and I, and I mean it. If you open my eyes and my understanding, I swear I'll spend the rest of my life helping other people do it. I closed the charts. And I laid there, I cried until I went to sleep. It wasn't until that weekend. I got the charts again, I started looking through them. I was just literally looking at them, having no understanding of what it was I was going to look for, nothing. 